Okay. Yeah, read the movie. Um, if you look at the movie, notice I'm the one who fixes the bug, right? <laughs> Joe and Mike are just sitting there complaining about it. I'm the one who actually fixes the bug. Um, yeah, that is Mars, from the picture from the Curiosity rover. I haven't got Erlang on Mars yet, but um, it's a goal. So yeah, okay. Oh, so yeah, the Erlang rationale. I'm I'm going to try and explain a little why Erlang and that things around Erlang look like they do. Okay, that that's the goal anyway. So um, we have to start. Okay, so what's a rationale, right? So fundamental reasons, the basis, an exposition of principles or reason. Just trying to explain why things look like, what they look like and why they look like they do. And the question is, why should we bother having one? And uh, a simple reason, well, one simple reason is it just helps users to understand um, how and why they should use things. So you can see this, this concept, this construct was designed to do this, which makes it easier to, to understand when you should use it. Um, to help the language designers, if you're going to extend the language, work, try and keep track of what's going on. Help the implementers, of course, so they can say well, what, what features we considered interesting. And help people wishing to extend the language. Um, I can say now, one very serious error we made is that we never wrote down why things look like they do. Okay. So we had long discussions about this. Things could get, we could discuss things for years, literally. And we, we arrived at a solution, and we thought this was good, good and we, but we never wrote down why, why things look like they do. Um, after all our work with them, we thought they were self-evident. Right? So how could anyone else, how could anyone not do it this way? They're stupid if they do it some other way. Right? Uh, not everyone agreed. But so um, I would say as a recommendation, to Chasse and the Elixir team, if you, when you make a decision to, for something, describe why you've made that decision. Why you've done this and not something else. Right? It will help people along for, um, much later. And the, the, so, one more thing, this is, I've found this very important because I've been talk, we were talking to people later on um, who we considered to be in the know and they did not realize why we did some things. Actually, what was the reasoning behind it, or actually why things looked like they did. So it's a very, um, I think it's a very important issue. Yeah, I, I found I've forgotten one slide. Concurrency and parallelism. So Erlang originally is all about concurrency. Okay, so, so concurrency from my point of view is, well, what's the difference between concurrency and parallelism? Now, if you go and look at definitions, many people just equate them. I, I don't. I take another view, uh, which is not mine. My, taken from others, where concurrency, that's a feature of the language, of the problem, or of your solution. The, the, the problem has lots of things going on and more or less at the same time, therefore I want a concurrent way of describing that solution. That's the problem. Parallelism, that's what your underlying system provides for you. So you, you might have one core, you might have 100 cores, you might have 100 machines or 1,000 machines. That's the, that's, that's the parallelism of it. And they're two different things. So you can run a concurrent language on top of a single, single system, which was what Erlang was done for the first 10, 15 years. And then you'll still get all the concurrency, but you won't have parallelism. You can run on a parallel system, and you'll get parallelism and concurrency. So yeah, that's just it. So... Um, the problem. This was the problem we were trying to solve. So Ericsson had, well, a switch called AXE. They still have it. And it was, a, it was and is a very successful product. It made Ericsson a ton of money. It was a very successful product as such. But um, how do you make programming these and maintaining these applications easier? So it was a difficult thing to maintain um, and, keep, and, and work and extend. But you had, to, you had the requirement of the char characteristics. They could not change. They had to be, have exactly the same characteristics of the system. And um, a bit about the problem domain here. So yeah, th th this is from a thesis my, well, the boss at the lab, Bjorn Decker wrote, some, about some of the problem domain we were looking at. So um, 
yeah, if you look through some of them, you need the concept of time in the system. Things will happen at a certain time or should, not take, or should take a certain time to do things. Um, they need to be distributed. Again, if you are, we'll get back to that more later, but if you want to make a truly fault tolerant system, you need at least two computers. However good your system is on one computer, when someone pulls the plug on that, it goes right. You need at least two computers. So you need distribution. Okay, we were controlling hardware. It was a very large software system. Um, it was quite complex functionality in it. So I've got a big system, I make a change here and it affects a lot of other things I probably hadn't thought about originally. Um, it should be in continuous operation over many years. And this is the cruncher, really. So typically from those days, I mean a, tele a telephone switch, that could be something the customer would be using for 20 years, right? And it should not go down very often. So if the thing crashes, that would have cost Ericsson a lot of money. That should ju just not crash. And the maintenance should be, you should be able to do everything while the system is running, code upgrades and what have you. Quality requirements, yes. Fault tolerance. Again, the system should not go down if something goes wrong. You should be able to accept the fact that something, things will go wrong and how do you design the system in such a way it keeps on going anyway. And the last one is um, large number of concurrent activities. Even in those days, we're talking here late 80s, uh, we were thinking of switches which might have hundred, hundreds of thousands of connections, maybe tens of thousands of calls going on at the same time, plus all the things the switch is doing anyway. Right? So that's what I thought was quite fun, re reading a couple of years ago about the, the C10K problem that came up, and which was, was supposed to be a very cruncher. For us, C10K was always trivial. Right? If, if our system could not manage, well, if our system could not manage more than C10K, it just wasn't interesting. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think they've got to see 100K now, haven't they, or see 1 million K or something like this, but th that's the level of concurrency we were thinking of. So, yeah. And um, so some reflections on this, around this, I think it might be important to point out. We were not trying to implement a functional language, okay? The reason it, it is functional is because it became functional as we were working with it. We were not trying to implement the actor model. We actually hadn't heard of the actor model while we were developing it. I know the actor model is, is about from the same time, so we're not, I'm not, not, trying to point it, not trying to say we were stealing it, we just hadn't heard of it at all. Someone came along afterwards and said, you're implementing the actor model. So then you go out and look at the papers, you find the actor model and say, oh yeah, we are, right, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but that was not a goal, right? <laughs> So what we're trying to do, we were trying to solve the problem. We had this problem, we were trying to make a system to solve the problem. And I want to point out here, it's not just the language. The language is part of the system, it's a system as a whole we we're trying to work on. And, yeah. So um, this, this actually had one benefit. It made the, the, the development of the language and the system was very focused. We had our problem, right? So what do we do, what do we need to be, to be able to design this problem? And we were lucky to have a, a very, from very early on, a small user group um, who were much more knowledgeable about the actual application than we were. Well, Joe and I knew quite a little, well, sorry, no, back. Um, it was originally started by Joe Armstrong. And the reason a lot of it looks like it does is he was working on a prologue system doing a set of rules for implementing tele telecoms. And um, he says I'm number two. I don't know, I can't remember from those days, but I'll, I'll trust him on that one. And the third person was Mike Williams. And Joe and I were pretty, not very knowledgeable about telecoms, or the internals of telecoms. So I could make a telephone call, but that, that was about it. Uh, Mike had done quite a lot of telecoms programming, so he knew what, what it was about. But we had this user group, and every time we came, we could come with a new feature, we could give it to them and say, is this useful? Right? Is this useful for your problem? And they would come back and say, yes, this, is, this, this idea is very good, we can use this. Or they'd come back and say, no, this is totally useless, we can't use it. But, which actually happened quite a few times, actually. So, um, yeah, that made our, our focus very narrow on it. And um, it, so, about to solve the problem, right? So it also meant 
um, we avoided um, a problem some language and system has is that the designers have a lot of very good ideas and you find a lot of things coming into the system and maybe each one in, in itself is good but the whole becomes too much. Right? We, we could avoid that problem because say, is this feature useful? Yes, then we put it in. No, we just don't put it in. Now I think Francesco said that probably Joe and I were more um, interested in adding new fun features into the language than Mike was. He was a sort of the sensible person here for this. But yeah, it's, um, but, but it, it is, that's one reason why if you look at the language and you look at the system, it's very basic. There are a few other reasons for that as well too, but that, that's why. So where we ended up, so the language should develop iteratively with our ideas, their feedback, etc., etc., and we arrived at a number of first principles, I'll call them. So lightweight concurrency, must handle a large number of processes, we're literally even from the beginning thinking sort of hundreds of thousands of processes, and process creation, context switching, communication must be fast. You should not have, that's something from our point of view, using the concurrency was a fundamental design um, goal or design factor. So if you're coming from an OO world, you start thinking about the classes. You're coming from, an, from the concurrency-oriented world, you start thinking about which processes the system has. Asynchronous communication. Um, this is what the application needed, and we found it was much better. We thought it was a much better base to build things on. You need process isolation. So what happens in one process must not directly or indirectly affect what happens in another process. And we get, get, this gets back to error handling. The system must be able to detect and handle errors. That was not an option. Right? If it couldn't do that, it was uninteresting. You need continuous evolution of the system, which in this case re referred to being able to upgrade the system with code while the system was running. Um, some other principles as well. well but we need a higher level language to get real benefits. In those days, we were considering languages like C, Pascal, Ada. We need something much higher level. And the language should be simple. Okay. Um, simple in the sense that you need a small number of basic principles, and if you get those right, you can build everything on top of that. Um, Then you get, the, you, they need to be a, f a small number of them and quite powerful, then it's good. So, so small in this case is good. You want to avoid the case where you've got a bunch of features in the language, then you find you need something else, but you can't do it with the existing features, then you, then you have to add a new feature, and then you get sort of creeping creaturism of the whole thing and it builds, right? And the, the last point is what we found out the hard way. Um, provide tools for building the system, not solutions. Most of the time we tried to provide solutions. That's when we, when we got the problem wrong and the solution wasn't usable. So there were a couple of, I can give some examples later on about things like that. So yeah, these are some of the basic principles of it. And that sort of reflects very much into the Erlang system, to the language and to the Erlang system. So getting on a bit, um, so we had the sequential language and we wanted a functional language. It is a functional language. It has a different syntax. Most functional languages have a different syntax. I don't think you'll find a functional language that looks like something with the, um, with the C-style curly braces, right? Um, but it's a very simple language. If you look at the Erlang syntax, you'll find it is much simpler than most other languages. It might be different, but it is a very simple and it's a very consistent syntax. Safe, well, yeah, no pointer errors, of course. That, that's a good way of crashing the system. Uh, reasonably high level. It was then, and it still is actually. It's dynamically typed. Um, I'll talk a bit more about that later. And the same thing with the last point, there are no user-defined types in it. That was, that was not by accident, that was by design. Um, dynamically typed, I think someone, someone said it because we couldn't in, implement a type checker. Well, we implemented a compiler, we implemented um, the language implementation, so if we wanted a type checker, we could have done that as well too. I mean, <laughs> if you teach, we taught ourselves the other bits, so why not? What, we could have done that as well, too. There are a lot of paper there. <laughs> yes. Uh, we actually, we had a, quite a lot of different backgrounds. So, um, J 
joked, we'd been working before with the Swedish spa Space Agency. So he was designing systems for controlling satellites, right, written in Fortran. Uh, Mike, well, he'd worked a long time in telecoms. He uh, was a very proficient C programmer. Um, before I started Yarlang, I'd done quite a lot of work with Lisp. Um, well, C, Pascal, Lisp, imp both implementing and using, and the same thing with logic languages, implement, using and implementing logic languages, especially concurrent logic languages. So we had a, we had a very broad base, and then we could have done a type system. I mean, it's not, it wasn't a problem. I like dynamically typed languages. So about concurrency, lightweight concurrency, yes, millions of processes are possible. And to do that, I'll say green here, I don't know if that's the current word for it, you can't use the operating system processes. Most operating systems will just not allow you to do that. Just too much memory for it. Um, so you can have millions of Erlang processes. And I think uh, WhatsApp's the best example of that. The one best example I know of anyway. They came out two years ago and said they were running um, two million concurrent TCP connections on one machine using Erlang. That would mean at least two million Erlang processes. So it's possible to do it, and it works. Um, we use processes for everything. There is no global state, so use processes for concurrency, yes, and also for managing state and any form of, any form of resources. And processes are isolated, so you can quite happily crash them without, without affecting anything else. And there is no global data in the system. Really, there isn't anything. Um, yeah. So one of the first principles behind things is without allowing things, right? I'm not going to call them objects because that means too much to many people. There are only two basic types of things in Erlang. We have immutable data structures. That's it. Erlang terms, they're all immutable, that's it. And we have processes. And if you look in the system, they're the only actually two different types of things you have in the system. Okay. Um, the ETS table, yes, there's an ETS table. Jose was mentioning that. It's in there. Um, the table itself is a mutable data structure, but all the data put that's in it is a normal standard um, immutable Erlang data. So I can go in and put new things in, it, in the table, but I can't modify one of the actual data in the table. It's all a mutable data structure. And actually, if you look at the ETS table, how it's implemented, how it works, it's very process-like. You could actually implement the ETS table, I've done it once, with a process and get, the same, get exactly the same functionality for it. So from our point of view, what, what's a process? So from our point of view, it's something which obeys the process semantics. Duh, right? It's parallel independent execution. The processes are independent and they run independently of each other. They communicate by using asynchronous message passing. Um, and you have links and monitors for error detection and handling. So if it's a process, I can link to it and I'll find out when the process crashes. And they obey exit signals. So if it's a process and I send an exit signal, it will die. That's what a process is. And um, how you actually implement it from our point of view is completely irrelevant. So a bit more here. Uh, everything's running a process. You cannot run anything outside a process. And all processes are equal. Erlang is a very egalitarian system. All processes are equal. There are no special processes, no nothing. There's nothing like you sometimes get the feel of in other systems with concurrency that you have a central thread of execution and they might start other bits and pieces like that. There is no central thread of execution. So, for example, the Erlang shell is just a process like anything else. That's why you can start up lots of shells if you want to. And there's no process hierarchy, flat process space. And again, as I say, before process used for many things, uh, managing state, concurrency, etc., etc. Again, process communication. Everything's by messages. There is no backdoor communication method between processes. If I want to tell a process something, I have to send it a message, and all the messages are asynchronous. Um, okay, a BIF here. That's the Erlang term for built-in function. Uh, they're the ones that are all in the mod, basically in the, all in the module Erlang. I know Elixir split those out and put them in a lot of, move them into different modules, amongst other things, process and kernel. But they're what's built into the actual system. Right? And um, all the pro BIFs around processes and communication are asynchronous. All they do is check arguments. Then they just send things off. It happens, right? 
And there is actually one exception, or so half exception to that. Um, that's when you send to a registered name. You're actually going in in a synchronous fashion and checking that the registered name exists before you send to it. But the actual sending is then asynchronous. A very nice feature with this is it works with distribution. Talk a bit more about that later. If you want to, doing think synchronous stuff with distribution is difficult. The underlying mechanism does not properly support it. If I send a message to another machine, it's very difficult to keep track of whether it actually arrived or not. Okay, it might make maybe local network, but here we're thinking wide, so it's very difficult to do that. And we, we got that, mostly got that right. But we actually ended up in one case where um, one of the reasons, well, people hadn't realized what we were thinking of here was the asynchronous. So if you look in the, the definition of the link function, it's not a, the re return value is not asynchronous. Originally it was. You tried to link to a process. If the process wasn't there. You got an exit signal back asynchronous again, saying it wasn't there. But now they put some synchronicity in there. And the, the, that was just one case they hadn't realized how we were thinking. So in a sense, it was our fault. Communicating with the outside world, ports. Well, there are two methods. There are ports, which makes the outside world look like a process. Um, they obey process semantics. You send messages to them. You link to them, they crash, you crash, etc. You crash and they crash. And so it fits in very nicely with the um, uh, Allen wave thinking. And we use ports to talk to hardware in the general sense. So when you open a, say, a TCP connection, you're actually opening a port to the outside world. And ports on the inside, ports need to talk to someone. If something comes in from the outside world, it's going to, it's a, it's going to become a message. And it has to be sent somewhere, so the port has the concept of a connected process. That's the process that owns the port. And anything that comes in from the outside world will be sent to that connected process. There are a number of BIFs now working on ports. You've got port command and a few others as well, too. Um, they didn't exist originally, and you still, if you don't want to use them, you can still just send messages to the port to get exactly the same feature. Actually implementing these, the, 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 fe the feature misfeature of having port, the BIF, port BIFs actually makes the implementation more difficult because now the implementation has to both, both handle asynchronous things and BIFs which also should behave asynchronously at the same time so the implementation has become a bit more complex. And honestly we were quite, we had a long discussion whether we should have a data type called a port at all or just make them, um, make them the same as PIDs processes. So you still get really bake in the internal thing here. Um, yeah, I'll get back to this in a moment, that, that thing in a moment. So error handling. Um, the basis here is, of course, errors will always occur. No matter how good you are, no matter how fantastic your system is, no matter how much help you, you have in your system, you will always get errors. And I don't agree with people who say, if we had a fantastic type system, we wouldn't get errors. You can always get errors, right? That, that's, that's easy. Um, you can be hardware errors. Bad input, something goes wrong in the system. Something I'm not, I, I don't have any control over does something with my system so I get errors. So that's just a fact of life. And again, if you, if you want, getting back again, if you want to build a robust system, you have to decide, you have to ha handle errors in it. If you don't, it won't, it will go down. So from our point of view, the system must never go down, okay? So um, parts of it might crash and burn, You'll get errors, coding errors, hardware errors, whatever, and they'll go down, but the system must never go down. Okay, this was for our type of system. We're thinking here telecoms type of Swiss systems. So yes, if something goes wrong, you might lose a call, but the switch itself will keep on going. And that, of course, may vary, or will vary, depending on your type of application. So um, the basis here is you have to sit down and think and work out what happens when something goes wrong. What should my system do when something goes wrong? That's what Greg was mentioning yesterday in his talk about. You, you have this thing, and it forces you to sit down and consider what should happen when something goes wrong. Should I let it crash? Should I try and save state so I can go back and keep on going, et cetera, et cetera. But it forces you to think of that problem. From our point of view, crash it, let the system go on. 
Yeah, Francesco, when he flew over, he had the Let It Crash um, T-shirt on, right? <laughs> but no one reacted, I don't think anyone reacted to it, but never mind. <laughs> Pardon? Ah. So yeah, with error handling, so yes. So this is what a system must do. It must be able to detect, must be able to detect the errors, contain the error, contain the effect of the error, and handle the error and recover from it. And you designing your system must decide what handling and recovering from means for you. Right? So yeah, robust systems must always be aware of errors. But you don't want to write error checking everywhere. One, it explodes the code. You're always going to get it wrong. So I've been there, done that. Or you just don't do it because you don't want to do it. I'm a sort of classic Unix programmer. Every system call just ignore the return values anyway. Right? <laughs> yeah. So what we want to do is we want to avoid writing error checking code everywhere. Right? And we want to be able to handle processes, processes crashing among cooperating processes. So the idea is that the general case is you'll have a bunch of processes working together doing something. It might be a connection, it might be a telephone call, it might be something else depending on what you're doing. And usually, if one of those processes crashes, um, the other processes really can't do anything sensible. So might as well crash them anyway, right? And you want to interact well with process communication. So it must fit in with the, with the standard communication mechanisms. Otherwise, you can, it can become all strange. So the basic philosophy, yeah, let it crash, right? If something goes wrong in a process, don't handle the error cases. Program as for the correct case, which is nice and easy. If something goes wrong, crash the process. Someone else will clean up after you, right? It's, it's a very nice idea. <laughs> so yeah. And the other hand is process based, yes. If one process crashes, then all, all cooperating processes, in this case processes which are linked together, should crash as well. And um, system process, the system can then monitor processes, actions, tasks, jobs, whatever you want to call them. And when, when they go down and crash, the system can clean up after them and knows what to do. It can reset stuff, it can reset hardware, it can reset um, uh, resources, whatever it might be. It might be restart them. Maybe these processes should always be running, so the system will then restart them. Sometimes, however, it, it can be quite reasonable to handle er errors locally. It might be sensible to do it locally. I can, I'm doing something, and if I get an error here, I can do a sensible thing, then of course you do it. Right? But don't be scared of crashing the processes. Right? So, so in Erlang, this again applies, most of, so far everything I've said here applies to Elixir as well. I think most of my presentation will apply to Elixir, about three slides that don't. Um, we're not scared of errors, right? We're not scared of errors, we're not scared of processes crashing. We know what to do. So the modules and code and code loading only have compiled code in the system. That's it. Um, yeah. And the module is the unit of code handling, both the unit of compilation and the unit of code loading. So you load a module, if you delete a module, you delete code, you delete the module. There's no way around that. You can have multiple versions of modules. Uh, the current, you can have two currently. I don't know what, exactly why we chose two originally, but we did. And this means there are no intermodule dependencies at all in the system. That means you can, you can quite happily remove, delete and, and reload modules on a per lot module basis, and you know you'll not make anything funny with the other modules. They might try and call you, and in, the, in your new code you mightn't have the refunction there, or the module might have been deleted, but you won't be, there's no dependencies between the modules. And all functions belong to a module, and again, all modules are equal. Um, sometimes you'll see in documentation things like system modules, but there's nothing special about a system module. They're just modules, the only difference is who, who, who wrote them. And there's no module hierarchy, it's a flat module space. And yes, this causes problem with module naming. Um, Elixir has one way of handling it by, by implicitly, well, first prefixing the module name with Elixir, then allowing um, dotted module names. That's just a way of getting around the flat module space. Um, yeah, there are quite a few things missing from the very early Erlang systems. Actually, when the systems used to write the first products, well, code handling, well, that was very, 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 very early, while we're still running on top of, um, of the Prolog system. 
because then we're just using Prolog's code handling. But as soon as we started writing our own um, emulator about 1990, we started doing code handling. Binaries took a while before they get in. So the first couple of th years, we didn't have binaries at all. So when you're talking to the outside world, a list of bytes you're sending backwards and forwards. Um, we didn't have ETS tables either. They came, also came in later. Funds were much later. OTP came about 95, 96, and NIFs are very recent. It worked, anyway. But it, a lot of these things we, you take for granted today, and which are fantastic, just didn't exist. Distribution, loosely coupled nodes like processors. We were thinking very dynamically here, so nodes could come and go. It wasn't like you set up a system with predefined system with a set of nodes on it. It was very, it was very dynamic. And it's completely transparent if you want to. So I mean, you can, you can do all the, um, the communication mechanisms and the error handling over, over to distributed nodes transparently if you want to. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. And having a everything asynchronous, the communication and the um, error handling mechanisms asynchronous made it actually much easier to implement um, over dist in, in, implement distribution. Except for this one feature of sending to a registered name on another node. I think Klaque Klaus Wikström, who did the actual distribution, I think he said something like, there were four different error cases you had to handle just to get that rel relatively simple feature working properly. So synchronous stuff is a pain. Um, yeah, OTP. Okay, so um, OTP, of course, wasn't the first attempt to writing systems with Erlang. And the first product, products made, um, they, attacked, they tackled all these problems. And we thought a lot about how, how do you build a system. And that's one reason why some of the features look like they do, because they, they, then you could use them to build systems. So a lot of the co most of the concepts you will find in OTP, they existed before. So the first product, they attacked these problems. They made a system called the BOSS, the basic operating system, which solved these problems. But it was for them. It was for their product. It wasn't generic. So when other, um, other products came along, you needed a generic system for doing this. So a lot of these ideas, these ideas, well, supervision trees and linking and how you build things together, they all existed in the BOSS. And they existed before the BOSS when we're doing things anyway. So it's a, set of, it's a large set of libraries. Basically, all the libraries are, are in a part of OTP. It's a set of rules and design patterns for building robust systems. That, that's the goal. How, how can I make a system which is robust and fault tolerant, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? That's the goal. Of the, that's the whole goal of the language. Generic behaviors, patterns, and tools, et cetera. Um, supervision trees. It has the concept of an application, which is actually a very bad name. Because it doesn't mean exact, doesn't at all mean exactly what most people think about when they say, hear the word application. So if you're looking at OTP and it talk, talks applications, think of components. It's, it, that's more like what it is. And, and each application here will have its own supervision tree using supervisor for the code in it. And you build a supervision tree to handle the case that you want to keep track of when processes die, and more specifically, if you want, if you need to restart them. If you don't need to restart them, you don't have to put them in a supervision tree. You can, of course, but you don't have to. So, yeah. Um, yes. At the systems point of view, Erlang systems, so systems built with Erlang, tend to be very OS-like. Okay? So if you look at it, you start up your typical operating system, whether it's Unix or whether it's um, Windows or whatever it might be, if you look there, you'll find there are a large number of processes running in the system which provide services in a more generic sense. They're just, they're just there, right, talking about the system. That's very much like um, when you do an Erlang system, you'll find the system provides you with a lot of services, whatever they might be. Um, there is very seldom a central thread of execution. There's very seldom you have one thread of execution which might start its further processes as they go. It, that's just not, typically not the way they look. You might have something which starts processes. For example, if you're doing a web server, you, you will have one process which sits and receives connection requests, but then it's, it will start another process, it will hand over, it will start another process to handle that connection, and will go back again. It most likely will not sit and handle the fact or, or monitor that process or anything like this for you. So it's very operating system-like. 
Again, getting back to the fact you can have lots of, have lots of shells. Of course, you can run lots of shells in your operating system as well, too. You do the same thing here. So it's, it, there's seldom a central thread of execution. And that reflects again into the basic primitives that went into the, that exist in OTP and the Allen system. So it's, it's not often, well, it can happen, of course, but it's not often when I'm doing, doing my thing that I'll start up another something else that I'll run in parallel to do something and then get, get the value back from it. I might send requests to other services, of course. Most likely I will. But they're already there, right? They're, they're already there and running. Yeah. So there's I, well, just some examples. So the, the system I.O. Um, it's process-based, of course. Everything's process-based here. It's built around the concept of an I.O. server. How am I doing for time? Almost. Um, it's built around the concept of an I.O. server. An I.O. server is something which on one side talks to it a device, whatever that might be, and the other side it talks to the Allen system. And it's the interface between them. Um, so it allows me, from, the, from my code side, to have generic I.O. functions. So I can, I can do an I.O. I can do an I.O. write to something. It will go to an I.O. server, and the I.O. server knows exactly what, what the other end of it, what the hardware or the outside world expects from this write. So back in those days, for example, the bad old days, you, you would have file systems or files which were, which were say, a set of lines of a predefined length. The I.O. server would handle that. I could write lines that were any length. It would handle the fact that it might need padding or whatever it might be, or things like this. And the other way around is um, I've got my generic I.O. server which knows how to talk to a device, and into that I can plug in I.O. functions. So I can, I can have one device and I can do lots of different I.O. to it. I don't have to read Erlang terms or lines or characters. I can freely mix between these things because I've separated the, um, uh, the functionality. Where I've, yeah, I've, put, I've merged it in one, in one place. And I found out later that the, thing we'd, the concept we've been done for doing input, that, that would have been rediscovered in the Haskell world and they called it an iterate. But it's exactly the same thing how the input side from the, in the I.O. servers work. And it uses concepts called process groups and group leaders. So there are actually process groups in, in, in Erlang. Um, again, this is the, we're talking about the Erlang system here. Uh, they're, not, they're much simpler. All the processes in a group, they just have the same group leader. That's it, right? The group leader has no idea if the process is a group, it's just a thing. And that, for example, is how, how the, how the front end's used. So um, when you start up an Allen system, you get a shell. If you press control G in the shell, you'll get back to this thing I call the user driver there. And then that's got a small little AI, that's got a small little interface where you can, where you can for example, start new shells, which is what Chase showed. And I can switch between shells. So I can have multiple shells running, or multiple other things. They don't have to be shells. They can be any program, any system that you start with a, with a start function running there. And they will get a group leader, and also all the default I.O. for each of those, those well, I call them tasks or jobs, uh, will, have this, will, will go to the same way. And this user driver, I can then use to select which, which, one, which one of these um, jobs I'm looking at. Typically get around the problem, if you look at most, say, running on Unix systems, you start up a lot of things in parallel, and they're all doing I.O., and, you, and you, your screen's just a big mess. Right? This allows to choose it. That's just something, just something in the system. Again, it shows, it shows sort of the, the, the operating system thought, think, behind, behind the system. And it's one of those things which is not really documented anyway. Okay. So, yeah. So, so more, okay, so that's more general cases. Some more specific things, which I think most people here have found already. Um, pattern matching is great. Um, it's fantastic. Um, we use them everywhere. You'll find the same thing in Alexia, everything, everything. It's for controls, for doing everything for it. And we had the goal, which we had managed to, to um, fulfill, that you have a constructor, how you construct data, the syntax for a pattern for pulling your parts the same. So if you, on the right-hand side, it builds things, on the left-hand side, it pulls things apart, or tests and pulls things apart. Just to make it easier to do it, that, that works, right? Um, guards, 
they were added because sometimes you can't express everything in a pattern. I might, I might have something here which I want to be an integer and I want it to be bigger than 10 but less than 20. I'm trying to put that, that's pretty impossible to put in a pattern. I have seen patterns, not our lang patterns, but other patterns in other languages where you can put this type of information in the pattern, but I think it became very unreadable. I found, I found this was much easier for it. So guards are, um, they're tests. They're not expressions, okay? The guard tests, it's slightly um, um, not clear here. They're tests most simply because they behave differently on failure. So when an expression fails, you get a process crash or something like that. You get an exception, a process crash. When a guard test fails, uh, all that happens is the guard itself just says fails and you go on to the next, op next option. So if I try and add two, if I try and add two atoms together in an expression, I'll, I'll get a bad arith error there. If I try to, to, to add two atoms together in a, in a guard, the, the guard just fails. So they're not expressions. And being able to do Boolean expressions in them, uh, it's a good thing, but has made the difference between, between them less clear. So that's, yeah, see we've got some Erlang stuff, right? Um, variables just bind one references. Yes, I know. I like it, okay, so if you, if you want to complain about it, don't complain about it to me. Um, what we did get, what we actually got wrong, I think, is the variable scoping in Erlang. So in the body of a function, of a function clause, uh, there, is just, there is just, well, no scope or one scope, however you want to look at it, and a variable there is the same variable everywhere. There is no scoping for it. And um, that is, can be confusing, to be honest. So if you're running from the Allen point of view and you get an unsafe variable error from the compiler, that means you're, you're trying to use a variable in a strange way because of the scoping rules. You might be thinking you, it, you're getting a new variable, but you're not. And yeah, okay, this affects pattern, well, not the scoping, but it affects the pattern matching. So if you use an already bound variable in a pattern, it, 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 it's an implicit test. It's not a rebind. In Elixir, it's an automatic rebind unless you've prefixed it with the, with the up arrow in which case it means you're testing against the value. And the equals operator originally was a simple assignment. But then we found we needed something more. Sometimes you need patterns, so does it, it was extended, so on the left-hand side you have a pattern. So it's typically a right-to-left type thing. And yeah. We added records, which we had a lot of flack. I think after semicolons, commas, dots, and the if, the records syntax is things most people complain about if you go onto the net, right? Um, they were there to solve the problem. So our first user group were actually doing a, building a product using it, said they wanted named fields and tuples. So they were using tuples for aggregates, but wanted names, fields, and tuples. And it's a perfectly reasonable request. But they wanted exactly the same efficiency as the normal tuple operations. Otherwise, they would not use them. This meant we couldn't do anything dynamic with our slower. So it had to be compile time. So it's a compile time feature. And the lack of, lack of typing means you had to include the record name in all the record operations. That's just a fact of life. Right? It also means from the Allen point of view, if you, I, I cannot use that syntax x hash person dot name equals Robert to set the name field uh, of the x record. Because that, what that means is I'm taking Robert and ch trying to extract it from the name field and check against it. That's actually a function call, so I'm going to get an error. We've got the Allen if. We're almost done. Um, this is, as I say, after semicolons, commas, and dots. This is the thing people complain about. It, it, it's a hack, OK? To be honest, it's a hack. So what we found is, um, OK, so originally there was only function, functions. We didn't have cases. We added a case. But sometimes you got the case. You, you got, we got the case of the case on the left-hand side there. I wasn't actually interested in the pattern matching. I just wanted the guard tests. So you, you get people writing things like that on the left-hand side, which however you look at it is not very nice. Right? It's not beautiful. So then we did the simple hack. OK, we just remove the pattern matching bit and keep the guard tests in and call it if instead. And that went into the compiler. It was an easy thing, thing to do, and the compiler was syntactically easy and everything like that. It was a quick fix. Right? They only used guards. It was very simple. Um, well, the result was it wasn't used very much, so we didn't really think about it. Because it's so limited, it wasn't used very much, but it does have its limitations. Um, yeah, so I'm almost done now. So. 
So the, getting back to the problem domain, if you look at these things, okay, we were thinking from the telecom side. If you look at these, these features or these requirements of the problem, you'll find they are actually quite common. So most systems today, say web systems or whatever, or any form of servers have these requirements on them. If you really start questioning the people who want them, most of the time, they, a lot of times they don't realize they want this, to be honest. They'll say, yeah, we want lots of throughput. But you want to do lots of things at the same time. Yes, of course, right? A lot of these things type, of course you want these things type of requirements on them. And there's one I forgot to put there, not, not in there, low latency. That, of course, was a definite requirement, what goes into timing requirements, for example, low latency of the system. And if you ask people, they're the type of things they take for granted and they'll complain about when you don't provide it, but they won't be in the requirement list. So this thing is not just, most of these things are not just telecoms. Okay. And that's the reason why Erlang in this, and Elixir in this case um, is actually useful today because it provides a solution to a lot of these problems and most other systems don't. Right? You'll find a lot of other systems that don't provide these things. Go, for example, provides concurrency, but it, doesn't, it can't handle errors. You just can't do the error handling. You cannot use it to build a fault tolerant system with great difficulty. And also, another feature is that the Erlang scale, the concurrency, Erlang concurrency model of doing communication and doing error handling scales. The fact that everything's asynchronous, the fact that processes don't share state scales. And um, the non sharing of state, for example, is also, well, it scales, but actually it makes things, many things more efficient. So you get, you get this quite, quite funny state, you, you have, for example, cache coherency. Yes, the system provides cache coherency, but the further away your, your cores are from each other, the more expensive the coherency becomes. So yes, you get it, but you pay for it, but you don't see it. Right? And in some cases, having separate copies of it is actually more efficient. Because I can look at my local, copy, local version of it, and that's much faster than looking at someone else's version. Right? So a lot of the things that the standard um, or say thoughts about building systems break down when you get into concurrent systems, we get into parallel systems, especially if you get into real, real high-scale par parallelism. So the model scales, right? Uh, that's another reason why, why it works. And just as a final pat on the back here to say how good we are, um, this, uh, uh, these are some, some um, companies using Alec. In this case, using, I mean, using Alang seriously in products. So, yeah, I mean, WhatsApp, of course, they're, they're the big one, but a lot of the other ones are using Alang here as well, too. Um, Ericsson R, it's used in their products, used in some of their products, and it's used internally for testing environments. Actually. Um, yeah, Heroku, Basho, of course, React. And you, you've also found, I haven't got a slide for it, but there are quite a few things implemented in Erlang which people use, although they're not interested in Erlang. For example, the uh, um, React. I, I say a lot of React users don't care it's written in Erlang because it's not going to do an Erlang interface anyway. Same thing with um, CouchDB. Part of that's implemented in Erlang. Most users, they don't care. They're not, they're not going to see the Erlang anyway. They can, but you don't have to. Um, RabbitMQ, same thing there. EJabbD, same thing there, right? So yeah, that's it. Okay. That's about done. Yes. 